Hi. Today we're going to be studying chapter eight, Obedient to Your Own Husbands. This is a popular study. <laughs> Most everything I teach is not popular, but it's good. And a lot of pastors and people will teach that women do not have to obey their husbands. That's just to children. Women are to submit to their husbands, but not obey. And the King James Titus 2, 5 says obedient to their own husbands. And every single version in 1 Peter 3, 5 and 6 says Sarah what obeyed Abraham. And they use the word obeyed. And ye are your daughters, if you, if you do likewise. So God definitely wants us to obey our husbands. There's this young man on YouTube, and he has six children, and he's very strong and outspoken about this. He's Catholic, but he says that women are to obey their husbands, period, in everything, except unless they ask them to sin. Yes, that's true. Very few pastors are willing to say that, that openly, but it's true, and I'm gonna show you that through these verses that I'm gonna be teaching you today. And I hope you looked them all up because there's 13 verses that God tells women the authority structure in marriage and it blows egalitarianism right out of the water. Egalitarianism, a meaning we're equal, we're the same, there's no differentiation in roles or responsibilities has led to the chaos that we see in our culture right now, women. God definitely has an authority structure in marriages, in churches, and in nations. And he's a patriarchal God. He, in, he created Adam first, and he wants men to be the leaders. They led all throughout scripture. Yes, there are a few exceptions, but it doesn't negate truth of God, what God wants and what his will is. So let's start in this. Women aren't crazy about this topic, but it's God's perfect will for you women. What is God's ordained order in marriage? Look at the following verses and write the answers beside it. Genesis 3, 16. Thy, des thy desire, this is after the fall. God says to this, this to Adam and Eve, thy desire shall be to thy husband and he shall rule over thee. Does that mean she desires him sexually or everything after the fall? No, it's not like the opposite. <laughs> Her desire will be to rule over him, to control him, because it, chapter two later it says sin's desire is to, you know, rule over you. So this is what it means. But he shall rule over you. God ordained, he made Adam first, and then even after the fall, he said, no, Adam will rule over you. And then there's a bunch more verses that support this. First Corinthians 11, three, the head of the woman is the man. He's head over us, women. 1 Corinthians eleven seven, 7. The woman is the glory of man. It says that the man is the image and the glory of God, but the woman is the glory of man. We are definitely made in the image of God, but we are the glory of man. We are to... Are you, do you make your husband look good? Do you speak good about him? This is what God wants of us. We're to give honor and praise to our husbands like Sarah did. She even called Abraham Lord, showing her respect for him. Then 1 Corinthians eleven eight. For the man is not of the woman, but the woman of the man. All this is to show God's created order. 1 Corinthians eleven nineteen. Neither was a man created for the woman, but the woman for the man. It was not good for man to be alone, so God created a helpmeet suitable for him, and that was Eve. Our created purpose in our marriages is to be a helpmeet to our husbands, to help them in their lives, not expect them to help us. Of course they do, they protect and provide for us, but that's their role. We're to help them in their mission. Okay. That was a better word. I need to keep my finger down here so I remember where it was. <laughs> Ephesians 5, 22. Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as unto the Lord. So we submit unto our husbands and everything. And it says that in a couple verses later, as unto the Lord. That means we don't submit to anything that they ask us to do. That's sinful. Um, 
So, and you, it has to be sinful. It's got to be clearly spoken of in scripture. It can't be just your conscience and what you think is right or wrong. It has to be sin plainly called in scripture that God wants you to not submit to. But things on your conscience, if his, your husband's conscience is different, you need to obey your husband in those things like sleep training, um, family bed, vaccinations, all of those things. They're not clearly spelled out in scripture, so you must obey your husband. You can definitely give your, your opinions and your point of view, but don't argue with him about it and submit to him because he's going to be the one held responsible for how he leads his family. Ephesians 5, 23, for the husband is the head of the wife, again, which was said in 1 Corinthians 11. Ephesians 5, 24, is that ch church is subject unto Christ, let the wives be to their own husbands in everything, everything, women. I put that in capital letters. We are to submit to our husbands in everything except for sin. Because we have to read all of scripture as a whole. And it also says in another verse, as unto the Lord, God never asks us to sin against him. Ephesians 5.33, the wife see that she reverence her husband. I know a lot of versions say um, respect, but the King James says reverence. Like, I like that word because it's like Sarah calling Abraham Lord. She reverenced him. Colossians 3.18, wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands. We don't need to submit ourselves to other men, just our own husbands. That's who God commands that we submit ourselves to. He is the leader of the family in the home. 1 Peter 3, 1, likewise, ye wives, be in subjection to your own husbands. These are to disobedient husbands, which we will go through in the next chapter. And I'll go into, I go into that a little bit in this chapter, but it's a lot more thorough in the next chapter. 1 Peter 3, 5, holy women, and dot, 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 I did read, write out the whole verse being in subjection unto their own husbands. Even the holy women of old, all the patriarch wives, were subject unto their own husbands. And 1 Peter 3, 6, even as Sarah obeyed Abraham, like I said, every single version says obeyed in that verse, calling him Lord, whose daughters ye are. He, God definitely wants us to live in obedience and submission to our husbands. 13 verses, women, in God's ordained authority structure in marriage. 13. In thir these 13 verses, God's will and order in marriage is firmly established. There isn't one verse in the whole entire Bible that commands husbands to submit to their wives. Many will use the verse, we're supposed to submit to one another, but then it shows after that who submit to who. Wives are to submit to husbands, children to their parents, and then servants to their, or we say employer, employees to their employees, employers. <laughs> it shows exactly who's sum, supposed to submit to who. There's no such thing as a mutual submission in marriage. Two heads make a monster. Every institution in the world has a leader and God chose the husband to be the leader in the family. Now let's take a look at wives who are married to disobedient husbands in 1 Peter 3, 1 and 2. How are they trying to win their husbands? So many women say, we only are to submit to husbands if they love us like Christ loves the church, or if they're good husbands, or blah, 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 blah. That's not biblical. This is how God commands women who are married to disobedient husbands to win them. How? By living in subjection to their husbands, by submitting to them, by obeying them. No, not if they ask them to sin, not if they ask them to watch porn, or get drunk with them or any of that kind of things, but you submit to them in everything that is not sin. This is how you may win your husband. So they may win, be one without the word, no nagging, no preaching at them, by the conversation of their wives. Conversation in the King James refers to behavior. A disobedient husband should clearly be able to see Christ in his wife, living in and through her by her godly behavior. Therefore, she will want to do all she can to win her husband to the Lord. We will go into much more detail in the next study. As I said, what does the Lord command of a godly wife in 1 Corinthians 7.10? Let not the wife depart from her husband. God doesn't want wives departing from their husbands. He wants 
wives who do everything they can to keep their marriages strong and together. He wants them to need their husbands, to submit to them, obey them, do everything they can to win them. But in the next verse, we are given a but and an if. It says, but and if she depart, let her remain unmarried or be reconciled to her husband. So some women who are in abusive situations or other situations that are just unbearable for them, they need some of they some of them will depart. God gives them an exception in this part, but if they do depart from their unbelieving husband, God commands that they remain unmarried, they don't get remarried to anyone else, or they be reconciled to their husband. They spend this time becoming the woman God wants them to be, praying for their husband, doing whatever they can to win their husbands back. There are times when a wife should not obey her husband. If he asks her to do something evil, such as watch porn with him, rob a bank, or participate in a threesome, she should disobey him. In most everything else, she should obey him. And if you don't know, ask a godly older woman in your life, you know, do I need to obey my husband in this area? Is this unbiblical, what he's asking me to do? If you can't figure that out, seek out a godly older woman in your church to ask. Or if you have a, no, don't ask your mom, unless she is really a godly woman and you can trust her to give her true truth and she wants to save your marriage and not hurt your marriage. In most everything else, she should obey him since this is God's will for her. How are wives commanded to win husbands who are disobedient to the word? By disobeying them and living as they please, no, but by living in subjection to them, thus obeying them as Sarah obeyed Abraham. 1 Peter 3, 6, as we will study and go into more depth in the next chapter. Practice obeying him in the little things too. When he asks for something or wants you to do something for him, do it as soon as you can, not when you feel like doing it. As you obey your husband, you obey the Lord. Since obeying your husband is what God asks of you, your husband is your authority and this is good. All of good God's ways are good. I used to put things off when my husband would ask me to do something, to send a check somewhere or do this or that. I would say, oh, in my own time. But now I try to purposely do it as soon as I can. He, when he asks me, can you make me a pizza tonight? I make him a pizza. I need more banana bread. I make him banana bread, you know. I try to really be conscious, conscious of obeying him in all of the little things. Because I kind of grew up thinking, no, we just have to obey our husbands in the big things, like um, whether to move or not. But no, it's in everything. Like the word says, we obey them in everything that they ask us to do. They are ahead. Some men ask their husbands to do a lot more than others. Some don't ask their wives to do hardly anything. But those wives can ask their husbands, what would you like for dinner? Um, what can I do today to please you? How do you, you know, whatever. How do you like me to dress? How do you like me to wear my hair? Ask your husband if he's not a leader. It's not your job to make him a leader, but when he wants to go out, ask where would you like to go and go where he wants to go. Start asking him and letting him lead. So many women, have we have such a strong desire to lead and to be in control and this isn't godly and this is not what God wants of us women. So learn to be obedient to your husband in everything and you will reap blessings, maybe not in this life, but in the life to come. And like I said in the last tape, the blessings are not a perfect, wonderful, happy life. It's joy and peace, which you will only find in obeying God, trusting and obeying God. For there's no other way to be happy in Jesus but to trust and obey. Bye-bye. <laughs>